Our gospel lesson comes from Luke 18, 18 through 27 this morning, the story of the rich ruler. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he replied, I have kept all these since a youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there, are, there is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own, distribute the money to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this, those who heard it said, then who can be saved? And he replied, what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. This is the word of God for the people of the God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Christy Brown. I'm the pastoral care intern here at Collierville United Methodist Church, and it is my great honor to be with you in worship this morning. A couple of weeks ago, my family and I were watching, we were having you know, a family movie night, and we were watching a show that um, suddenly took on a very not PG subject matter. So we backed out of that show and we were scrolling through Prime looking for another thing to watch when we decided to introduce our girls to the movie Evan Almighty. And maybe you remember the Almighty movies. There was Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey and then Evan Almighty with Steve Carell. In both the movies, Morgan Freeman played God. The theology is not perfect, but they are fun family movies. Well, in Evan Almighty, the main character, Evan, has finally arrived. His hard work has paid off, and he has finally made it. He plays this news anchor who ran for Congress and won. So the movie starts with him and his family moving to the suburb of Washington, D.C. He has an attractive and supportive wife and three terrific sons. And waiting for him there was a large, beautiful home and a promising future in politics. All the ingredients for his perfect life were finally right in front of him. The house, the family, the job, the power and the status that would bring him fulfillment. Only God had other plans. God wanted him to build an ark. And there is a lot of creative license used in the retelling of this flood story. Evidently, God really wanted Evan to look like Charleston Heston. His hair and his beard keep growing and they turn white. Animals would follow him around in pairs. And God wanted him to wear these old robes. And whenever he resisted wearing them, his nice suits would magically turn into the robes again. So finally, Evan could no longer resist God's call and he began building the ark. Everyone around him thought he'd lost his mind. His family, his colleagues, everything that he had worked so hard for was suddenly at risk. But he risked it all in order to be obedient to God. The Hollywood ending, of course, is that in building the ark, he restored his family relationship. He protected the people from the environmental fallout of a greedy decision made by a bad politician. In the Hollywood ending, Evan still came out ahead, just with a better work-life balance. 
This morning, we're kicking off a new sermon series called If Only. And for the next four weeks, we'll be looking at some of the things other than Jesus with which we find ourselves trying to fill our hearts. If only I had more money. If only I had the right relationship. If only I had that car or that job or that vacation. If only reflects the things that might satisfy for a moment, but are never really enough. This week we're looking at fulfillment. If only I could find fulfillment. Today's passage is interesting. So many people came to Jesus asking for healing or for help. But the rich ruler of today's passage, he already had everything that he needed in this life. Instead, he wanted to know what he must do in order to inherit eternal life. The ruler is likely not a Roman official. Rather, he's probably a religious leader, maybe a member of the Sanhedrin. And he started by calling Jesus good teacher. But Jesus is far from flattered. He was quick to point out that only God is good and to point to the sovereignty of God in his answer. And then Jesus reminded the ruler of the commandments. He started listing midway, and he named several of the ten, stopping short of the last. And the ruler responded, I have kept all of these since my youth. And there's a lot of room for interpretation in this passage on how to characterize the ruler. Is he sincere and seeking? Is he haughty and self-serving? Preachers and theologians have speculated. Is he hopeful in hearing the commandments as an answer? Or is he overconfident? I admit, I tend to take a soft lens to him. I have a lot of empathy for this young ruler. But Jesus reminds him of the commandment he didn't list. There is still one thing lacking, Jesus said. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Oh, it's hard. It's a challenging passage to read, to understand, to accept, to adopt. And I have sympathy for this rich ruler because, my friends, he is all of us, and he could be any of us. I kept thinking of Evan Almighty when studying this passage because the character in the movie is a lot like a modern-day version of the rich young ruler. He embodies so much of what we think will bring us fulfillment. The family, the job, the house, the car, the influence, and the prestige. The culture and the time of Jesus was an incredibly status-driven structure. And I would say that is certainly the case in our culture in suburban America today. Not in every neighborhood, not in every city, nor in every family, but for many in this congregation, the pressure starts early and it is relentless. It is the cycle of chasing and striving that starts from the time that you were born and your mother was first shamed for whether she bottle or she breastfed, and it just never stops. There's a playground competition on who is reading first, because we all know little Johnny needs to get into the right preschool so that he can get on the right academic track in kindergarten so that he can take the right classes in high school so that he can get into the right college and that way he can meet the perfect spouse so that he can get married and buy the house with a picket fence and have his 2.5 children and work and work and work to try to hit the next benchmark which might finally bring him fulfillment. Of course, some people take other paths But for many, it's still the same chase, that constant striving for the next thing that will finally bring us fulfillment. It's a moving target, it's impossible, and it's exhausting. On one hand, we might think, yeah, if I were the rich ruler, 
I could get off this merry-go-round. I could give it all up, really follow Jesus. But on the other hand, the reality is that for many of us, when we hear what Jesus told the rich ruler, we know how impossible that request would be for us. So I'm soft to the ruler. And there's a reason why this story is included in Matthew and in Mark and again here in Luke. It's important to understanding Jesus and to understanding ourselves and our human nature. And you will have treasure in heaven, Jesus promised him. Only treasure in heaven is one of those really hard to comprehend things. What we know are the pressures that we have here and now. In the movie, God forced Evan's hand. He would literally not take no for an answer. We see here in the text something different from a Hollywood story. God doesn't coerce us. God doesn't force us to put our idols down. We are covered and called in grace, but as gentle. We, like the rich ruler, are free to walk away. Jesus offers. Jesus told him how to gain eternal life, and even more, Jesus invited him into his presence and into relationship. Then come and follow me, Jesus said. Jesus reminded the young ruler of the last commandment, thou shalt not covet. And the ruler knew that he loved his riches and his possessions and his status and his lifestyle more than he loved God. Jesus' teaching pointed to the fact that this ruler was breaking both the first and the last commandments. His money was his idol, and he coveted his possessions and his position more than God. Jesus' intention is not so much to impoverish the ruler, but to call out his self-righteous claim that he obeyed the commandments when clearly he did not. The passage continues, and when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. And it is sad, it's convicting, because self-denial is essential to discipleship. But self-denial is really hard in our instant gratification world. Jesus knew that this man's money and his status were at the center of his life. And Jesus invited him to set that aside, to recenter his life. And the reward would be both companionship with Christ on this earth and eternal treasure. The ruler went away in sadness. And the others there wondered, then who can be saved? Who indeed? If this rich man who could afford to give sacrifices and pay alms to cover his sins could not be saved, who could then? Ultimately, we attain eternal life not by what we do, but by believing in the God who has already done it for us. But how can we lay aside these things that the world tells us again and again will finally bring us fulfillment for the one who fulfills like nothing else can? Jesus points back to God again. What is impossible for mortals, he said, is possible for God. With God, in God, through God, it is possible. It is possible to put our priorities in the right order. To know that chasing after the next big step, whether it's the right job or the right marriage, or when your kid finally gets his act together, or when you can retire, will not bring the kind of fulfillment that Christ can. With God, we can covet prayer rather than position. With God, we can offer community instead of competition. And with God, we have been given the ultimate means of fulfillment in Jesus Christ. We can get stuck living in that space of if only, but we don't have to. Jesus came to give us life 
and life abundant. Jesus offers fulfillment. It might not look like what we thought fulfillment would look like, but it's worth it. And with God, it is possible. Amen.